as I said at the uh, beginning, uh, this is meant to be a pilot. And um, what I want to do now is really invite you to make your own contributions, ask questions, so we can have a, an interactive dialogue. Uh, so who wants to go first? When you do so, please tell us who you are, and I can see you on there. Tell us where you're from. Any papers? Uh, I see a few. Neil, Neil Dyer. I'm uh, Neil from FTI Consulting, we're working with SIPA uh, in the promotion of Cyprus as an investment destination among the international media. Uh, so my question is, uh, one of the great attractions of Cyprus, especially for companies outside of the EU and also important for those inside, is the membership of the EU. How much is that still seen as an important factor within Cyprus? Well, oh, Neil. Thank you very much for the question and thank you for all the support over the last so, so many months. I think uh, uh, your contribution has been very valuable to handling uh, the communication aspect of uh, Cyprus as a whole. Now, to that question, I think it's certainly considered as extremely important even today. I heard this morning and in another uh, presentation, I was last week actually, a lot of people talk about them and us them meaning Germany and the number of other countries and us as being the opposite side. I think we need to get over this, to be honest. We need to realize, as we have clearly been shown and this experience shows that very, very clearly, we are within the European Union and we have to deal within the European Union. And certainly, I think we have to stay within the European Union. Um, we should not try and blame everything everybody else. We should undertake our responsibility. We should make sure that we learn from our mistakes and we should make sure that this thing doesn't happen. And certainly I think Cyprus's position is within the European Union and within the Europe. This morning actually I had on one of my slides a comment that one of the advantages of Cyprus being within the European Union and the Europe. And when I said the Europe, I saw a lot of smiles, and <laughs> I mentioned I, I see why you are smiling. However, certainly, Cyprus's position is in Europe and in the Europe. Thank you. I see quite a few other. It's Peter Dasu. Hi, and um, thank you to Tashkent Investment Bank in the city. Um, if you look at one of our neighbors, Israel, one of their major growth engines is doing technology. Um, and given how highly educated the, the CIPRA community are, does the government have initiatives in place to encourage development in that part of the economy? Well, R&D is a very big issue, and certainly Israel has done exceptionally well. Of course, if I'm not mistaken, I was there last October, 6% of their GDP is put back into the industry. That's an amazing number. That's close to 10 billion euros. Um, Cyprus certainly has this, and within SIPA's uh, strategic plan, R&D has been identified as one of those departments, and uh, a technological part has been in on the table, and it's on and off the table actually for a for a very long period. It's time certainly to take a decision on a number of issues, and I'm sure that there will be incentives. <coughs> However, it's an industry that I personally feel, without being an expert in it, that will take a number of years to develop and start producing the goods. So, although it may well appear within the priority sectors that will be clearly defined by the, by the government, it is not possibly one that will deliver the goods immediately. So, it may take second or third or fourth position in that respect. Because I know that there are a lot of floods here to have an IT uh, interest. Uh, we'll try to make it interactive, so I'll take it um, um, George and Sina. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right, can I uh, pick on uh, what you presented to us? Um, it doesn't touch on manufacturing. Well, that's who you are. Yeah. Sorry, I'm George and Sina. I uh, work businesses in the high tech industry in England. And uh, I'm an engineer by profession. And I've uh, had my own high tech company for the last 17 years, working in the high tech industry uh, since 1983. 
<coughs> what we haven't seen uh, as one of your priorities is manufacturing, encouraging high-tech industry cycles. And I think that's a fundamental uh, kind of shortcoming. And I'll tell you why. You're planning to have a gas industry in the next four or five years. Now, the gas industry, it needs a high-tech industry behind it. You either want to invest now so that you have the people with the skills when you need them, or you have to buy them. And you have to buy them from Siemens in Germany and so many other countries. If you invest in high-tech industry now, you can have employment, not in three or four years, you can have products kind of cycles in the next six months. We can discuss this, uh, and I can point you how it can be done. The other thing is, you have in Cyprus thousands of uh, qualified engineers and scientists. They come back to Cyprus, and what happens to them? The so-called lucky ones, they end up as government employees in some menial tasks. They get lots of money, but they, they, are, they don't produce anything. Then you've got the others who they emigrate, they come to Presta Kingdom, and I meet quite a few of them. And when they come to England, they are productive. They work in companies, they are good engineers, they form businesses, they produce. Then you've got the third group, which are unemployed. And you've got thousands of these people that can utilize to create real jobs with export, uh, exporting most of the goods. Um, I think it's something that you need to, uh, to consider and maybe elevate it up your priority list. Because, uh, well, let's say you need an engineer within your, your circle of, uh, of associates uh, to point you on what can be achieved. Thank you very much, George. I'll give a very quick response. It's not directly related. I mean, I expected not to agree with you. But my response would be as Siba and, and as a person, certainly we are totally open for any suggestions and the idea that anybody can have so much the better if they are experts in their fields. Any time. This is why we're here, and this is part of this, this course here. Um, anything, anyone else wants to speak on RMT specifically? Okay, and we'll then move on to where the course we want to do. Yeah, Mr. Kidegis, um, University Law Lecturer at the Conference I wanted to first of all thank our speaker for giving us such a vivid insight into uh, the position in Cyprus. And I also wanted to thank Mr. Groshovis for taking the initiative, not just here, but elsewhere, to help um, promote what he described as a strategy. Uh, just have a, a couple of observations, if I may. Um, I'm going to just focus my remarks on the Anglo-Cypriot relationship. And I've, I've made these remarks to, uh, in the past, but I thought I'd just reiterate them uh, this evening. When an approach has been made to potential British investors in Cyprus. I appreciate that their concern is with their shareholdings and their making money. But there is also a British national interest at play in Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus represents the eastern outpost of Western liberal democracy. Just to the east is Syria. Cyprus is becoming encircled by Islamist regimes. We need Cyprus to remain a uh, bastion of Western liberal democracy and the rule of law. We also need Cyprus to act as a bulwark against Islamism. So we need to maintain the economic health of the island in order for its political status as an EU member which promotes and defends EU values. And I would also go one step further, I'll conclude on this thought, that the development of, of Cyprus as an energy producer is of critical importance to this country because it will enable Cyprus to become an independent energy supplier, which will enable this country and the EU generally to lessen its dependency on Russia, the Arab world, 
and the lines of communication through Suez and the Gulf. Cyprus is to the north of the Suez Canal, and even if the Suez Canal shuts or if the Gulf is if made inaccessible, <coughs> there is an alternative energy uh, resource here in Cyprus. So, to sum up, there needs to be a, um, a change of perception. Cyprus is often seen as a sunshine destination for makers, it's seen as a troubled spot, it's seen as a partitioned island, de facto partitioned island. It now needs to be seen in a different political and geostrategic light, and uh, I, I commend you for both of your efforts. Thank you, Claire, and uh, thank you for your incisive remarks. Um, any contributions relating to what Claire has just said? Anything that Well, the only thing I can say, I heard it this morning very carefully as well, and I was very impressed by your presentation. <coughs> it's very clear, and I think I made it clear in my presentation as well, in somehow that politics and economics these days, thankfully or unthankfully, are very, very strongly interrelated. Whether we like it or not, this is the name of the game, and we have to learn to play it. I'd like to move on to other fields. I do see a number of other people here who have expertise in, in, in other fields, like tourism, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark uh, Blackwell mm -hmm. is a, an authority on the subject, and uh, a great friend of Cyprus, delighted to hear you. Mark? Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. <coughs> I, I I think if I look at what's uh, happened in Cyprus through the development of tourism, um, in a way uh, what has been a disappointment has been the fact that the investments which have been made um, have actually ended up by being only 54% occupied. Um, so the actual revenues are not there for the capital which has been invested. So the question then that arises is, how can that change? Now there is a certain mindset which exists, which is that you mentioned the sunshine you know, of the island, nine months of the year, and it's very easy to organize tourism on that basis. You invite tour operators in different countries to offer um, in brochures and on the net and so on, and uh, people turn up with airplanes from Russia and uh, the UK and elsewhere. But of course they do turn up only for the sunshine. So the important element is then to say, is there a possibility, and you mentioned only a little bit of that actually in your presentation, Harry, um, to diversify the offer and organize the marketing, which actually takes some real effort. In other words, it doesn't just happen because you turn up and talk to a tour operator, so okay, I'll put a program on contract a few hotels. It actually needs a lot more effort. In, in You mentioned sport tourism, that's one thing, but there are many, many other areas which are non-weather related activities that if you really worked at them, you could actually make an offer which was attractive in the months which are uh, not full. Because at the moment you have um, it very low in January, coming up and it's over full, actually, in July and August, and then it goes down again. Absolutely. So you've got all these opportunities, and they are very substantial, but without marketing, and without actually redesigning some of the offer, and getting the commitment of the, many of the entrepreneurs who are there, I don't think uh, um, these things will happen. So this worry uh, you mentioned before about procrastination, it seems to me that this, now, this awful situation that you found yourselves in, this is the opportunity. The investments are already there. It only ne needs a certain number of other things to be done in order to galvanize these activities. And you could start having extra revenues coming through even next winter if you were clever. Now there's one, if I may Peter, just one other thing just to mention. The uh, idea of casinos is extremely important. It, it has its downsides, and the legal frameworks need to be very carefully worked out. But also, the other part of this is where do all the profits go, and the, how much are they taxed, and does some of the money come back in various ways, specific ways, which are 
to do with promotion and other things. In other words, actual hypothecation of some of the uh, taxes which arise. Because the one I'm familiar with is the one in uh, Tashkai, Estoril, that area there. Because um, they have an, a mechanism like that, which is a very significant benefit. And that will also, uh, the casinos, because they will be also winter, this is an opportunity of building other things related to, around that to them. So I think there are some very interesting signals which you gave in your excellent speech, but it seems to me that there's an awful lot more that could be done to galvanize things. I don't know if other people agree, but that's from an outsider perspective, um, but much. nevertheless involved heavily with Cyprus over the years. So mm -hmm. great contribution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, uh, I'll start from the last thing about the casinos. Mm. Um, now, actually, I'll say, certainly, I give a manager, 10, 15 manage the minutes to capture everything that's being done inside mm. at the moment. There are a lot more, hopefully, being done. Mm. Uh, as far as the casinos are concerned, <coughs> this was exactly what you have described, was exactly what we have proposed mm. to the government that the casino should be. And uh, we have actually said it should be much more than just a gambling mm -hmm. spot. It should be much, much more. It should be an attraction, something that may be a milestone for Cyprus mm -hmm. and an attraction for the whole area. Um, furthermore, <coughs> on, on the rest, on the 54%, uh, I assume we'll talk about the hotel slot factors. Uh, over the years, um, I had a presentation actually this morning on how Cyprus could be a cruise hub, mainly for winter. For the obvious reasons. Um, clearly, there is a lot that has to be done in this respect, and I think, again, people have sat down and are looking at ways of how they can make it happen. There are a lot of niche uh, sectors within tourism that can be attracted, and clearly, utilizing the investment and uh, whatever this is, whether it's a bus or a hotel or anything else, needs to uh, increase. Um, Important uh, to this aspect, of course, is also the, the issue of Cyprus Airways, which um, has its own issues. It is also, unfortunately, the mirror a lot of times of the tourism industry, say the league, maybe sometimes also of the country itself. So uh, we should be looking at that as well. But clearly, the tourism industry in Cyprus has potential, I think it's been looked at very, very carefully, especially the winter period, which is where the gap of the rest of the 46% comes. Mm -hmm. In tourism, it remains a key um, area of the economy of Cyprus. And um, it seems to me that um, the Cyprus government in the past hasn't really invested enough in, uh, money in, in, this, uh, in the promotion of tourism in this country. Um, uh, I'd like to invite some more contributions around tourism. I mean, tourism is an area that um, interests me. I'd like to hear some suggestions or ideas you know, in relation to this area, particularly this new idea of a casino. And how do you see that? Because I have some reservations about it. Well, of course there are. I mean, there, there are significant downsides and things to manage. You know? Right. Yeah, it's difficult. So, probably a bit more. <laughs> well, like, it is extremely well managed. I mean, you send out all the signals in my truck, and all the type of tourists, you know, it's the personal things. It's very difficult with tourism because everything is so expensive. Yeah. They go there and they're absolutely horrified at the prices. The restaurants are overpriced. I mean, it's really <coughs> difficult. And the fares. And the fares. The fares. Coming back to the, uh, the prices, what yeah. um, customers were in this time period. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Specifically last year, one of the says to me, I'm not going back. Because he was paying six euros for a small quantity of beer. He was, uh, yeah, and I've from more than one person. Now, <coughs> if you go to Cyprus now, you pay uh, with stem prices, <coughs> in a little taverna on the outskirts of London. In the <coughs> same time, and better value for money. And that's, you know, it's a reality. I mean, okay, you have tourism, but you need to constantly 
improve your product and the, the quality uh, and value of the product. Say you're only going to welcome <coughs> the very rich, it's not going to succeed. So the model needs to be constantly reviewed and revised for tourism to carry on contributing to the economy. Uh, I some more views. Uh, Nick Yeah, my name is Nick Yano. I'm an independent businessman. And one of the businesses I own, sorry, I forgot to congratulate you on your initiative. Thank you. Uh, one of the businesses I own is a villa rental business in Cyprus, echoing some of the things that you've been saying. The biggest problem we've had over the last two years is the cost of the flights. Now, it's very, really, very really simple. It's a bank holiday weekend, and B and Q wants to drive traffic to its stores. What does it do? It reduces the price of duplex paint, um, sand, cement, anything, and it brings the traffic there. And they then spend money on other items. Now, a few years ago, the British government dropped the VAT rate in this country uh, to help the economy. If the Cyprus government could reduce the landing charges at the airports, so they could transfer that savings to the client. We will see an increase in traffic. Now, you, the gentleman over there, sorry, my last slide's not pronounced. That's all right. Yeah. The gentleman over there mentioned about <coughs> off peak um, mm -hmm. tourism. I'm pleased to see that golf is on the agenda because golf attracts a lot of tourism, especially in countries like Spain, who have got the sunshine. We seem to be very slow in getting these projects off the ground. And uh, I'll speak with experience here. There's, there's one project that was given a go ahead maybe five, six, seven years ago in Arnica. Uh, sadly, the contractor, as we've heard of him, he's got the, the license to build this golf course. As yet, it still hasn't started. Why? Um, in um, Cape Greco, near around Villasar, there's another golf course that's been given the go ahead. Um, I know the developer who's got that project, he's actually built five or six villas, quality villas, and he's actually sold the villas. But he hasn't started the golf uh, project. Why? Because he's expected to build, or required to build, I should say, a desalination plant to, to provide the water to water the greens. Now, this is too expensive for him, so he hasn't built it. Consequently, I think he got the license five or six years ago again, but it's still sitting reliable. All the time, we're not bringing people to Cyprus. This will increase jobs. So these are two very simple areas. We've got to look at the water the situation of this elevation plant, and we've got to look at the cost of the flights uh, of dropping the landing charges at the two airports. Thank you, Nick. Um, do you want to respond to either of those um, interventions? Uh, just, just two words about the airport. It is certainly an issue, not only the cost, also the frequency of flights for some destinations. I mean, on the other in the UK. The UK obviously is uh, pretty well, but if you go into other destinations, the problem is much more intense and much more dimensions. Uh, as far as the golf courses, yes, it took actually the government a number of years to start finding the formula of giving licenses. However, those who are licensed, it's not the government's policy or anybody else's fault that they are not proceeding. It's their own, it's the businessman's decision or lack of finance, for example, possibly this day that these projects are not uh, proceeding. And I'm sure the fact of the desalination plant was part of the initial agreement that quite possibly that it wasn't instigated afterwards. So it should have been considered. Having said that, I think over the last few years, the problem issue has been uh, significantly reduced. Uh, not only because of uh, natural causes, but also because we have um, the desalination plants working constantly, producing even when it rains. So uh, I'm not sure that should be such an issue. Yeah, there, is a, there is an alternative to that. In the UK, there's also um, government owned golf courses. Well, well, not government, but uh, owned by local councils. Why doesn't the government? Um, like it's a good thing to do with the state of the I'm not sure they, uh, they will be able to find the time finance in the UK, certainly not the local councils. Thank you very much. Um, I've seen the lady over there. Tell us who you are, please. <coughs> I'm Elizabeth Block, a journalist. I'd like to ask about food, because food hasn't been mentioned. Um, forgive me, I've only been to Cyprus once, but I do not believe that you claim to have one of the world's great cuisines. 
and I'm wondering if if there is a hospitality school there, and I believe there is, but what I'm suggesting is, is something more ambitious. Why not get the government or some of these um, rich hotel chains with a lot of Cypriot interest to fund a hospitality and school of cuisine, bringing in a lot of unemployed uh, European youth from Spain, Greece, of course, and other countries, and set the standard really, really high, sort of what Jamie Oliver, sort of thing Jamie Oliver does, because a lot of people think about food. If you go to France, you don't have to worry about the food. You know it's going to be mainly good, though maybe not as good as it once was, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Just a brief you know, we had something along those lines being uh, developed, I think it was a little bit more than a decade ago. However, it ceased uh, operation for some reason, but I, I hear that people within the industry <coughs> are looking at it once again, not only for Europe, but also for the Middle East and the Gulf area. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Yanni, um, I'm in charge of surveying Cyprus. Um, <coughs> uh, coming back to the golf course thing, I, I believe that the reason that um, some of these golf courses have been taken off is because they were buying them, basically, that's, that's the main reason. And I think the government now has actually increased the building density on some of these courses so that they become viable. And I think we'll probably see some of those going ahead. Um, just wanted to ask about the, uh, the uh, incentives government is bringing in now um, and how your organization is going to assist say the very big projects because we've seen two or three very big possible uh, investments that led to nowhere but the Qatar thing which was a fiasco at the end of the day. And also the Chinese with the line of the um, how, how are we going to overcome these problems and what's being put in place? So we can encourage these people to come back. <laughs> it's very difficult to answer the question, especially for the two projects that you mentioned. There's we will first have to pinpoint what went wrong, yeah. if something went wrong. Yeah. I think the cat's uh, was the thing <coughs> started from day one because they couldn't even agree on the value of the land. Uh, yes, so I, you <laughs> know, um, on the other hand, you know, commercially speaking, an out of the box idea would have been give them the land for free, they will develop something, they will invest, and then as it happens, especially with sort of these sort of nations, once they start investing in a destination, you can get a lot more investments going. However, you would obviously have the local community say, okay, why don't you do it for free to us? So, you know, it, it's a balance that you need to be able to handle. Now, the, the other project at the airport, obviously, that was a totally different thing was a legal issue between the long term contract that the government had with the MS, which was the land at least the land for 25 years. Uh, I'm sure that the, if the wig is there, they will find a way at the end of the day to do this project. Thank you very much. Uh, time is running, so I, I know that we haven't got a lot of time uh, here, and uh, we have to do the is uh, soon. So there is one other area that is uh, extremely significant that we need to discuss uh, tonight, and that is the energy uh, sphere. And I know that uh, Adam Lomas is uh, the authority of the subject. We've got that as a lot of people as well. I'd like to give him a to say a few words about how they see it. Adam? Okay, well, first let me introduce myself. Um, I'm a Brit, I'm afraid, which probably reduces my credibility somewhat. I also have a Dutch wife, which might make you all hate me a lot. <laughs> but it means I understand, and I've lived in Cyprus for five or six years. I went there to live seven years ago. I love the place, and I'm not leaving either. So I'm retired. Uh, I spent 35 years in Shell. And um, so, that, so I, I, I've seen a lot of energy projects starting. You know, we were in Omar when it started, we were in Brunei when it started, and I was in Nigeria at various places. And maybe just four or five minutes on a, lot, on a couple of thoughts. The first thing is, um, it is absolutely good, this energy. You know, I mean, if I don't do everything else that's happening, the energy, if it's done properly, you know, the gas is done properly, it could be a driver for an enormous amount of new investment in Cyprus. Just look at Aberdeen and the UK. You know, I mean, 
and money here didn't just come out of the oil and gas. And in fact, the government makes very little money out of the world in the UK. It makes an awful lot of money out of the infrastructure. And probably the amount which will come from the service industries is four or five, four or five times larger than the actual gas industry itself. And so that's the first thing. There's a lot of real optimism, I think, around it. A couple of things do concern me. And let me just share those with you, not in the spirit of being negative, but just in reality terms. The first is that we actually haven't got any proven reserves at the minute in Cyprus. And a lot of numbers are being thrown around still at the minute, some of which may be true. But there is no proven reserve. What do I mean by that? Until we drill the appraisal wells, which are coming, we hope, by the way, they've been delayed two or three times, so you have to ask yourself the question, why is that happening? Until we drill the appraisal wells, there are no proven reserves. No one will invest in Cyprus until there are proven reserves. And there's a legal definition for that. The legal definition for a proven reserve is that this has to be a proper development plan for the gas reserves in Cyprus. And there is no plan. <laughs> and that's my biggest concern. And, and that is why I am, because I'm interested, talking about this a lot in, in, in Nicosia and also talking with oil companies. Shell I used to work for. Um, I went to see them last week. I saw BP this morning. Last week I went to Brussels to talk with uh, another guy you probably wouldn't like very much called Martin Bebey, who's in charge of the bailout, just to ask what's the EU position on this. And I, I'm beginning to see the possibilities for a change in, in perception. And I think that's really important. But there are a number of things which are going to be absolutely crucial. Uh, the first thing is moderation of the enormous enthusiasm which has been talked up for all kinds of political reasons. And I, and I'm sorry if I speak the truth here. You know, for political reasons, people are saying things which are frankly impossible to achieve. It is going to take four years as an absolute minimum before we get any gas ashore. You know, and that's even assuming that we do it in the quickest possible way. And all the things you've talked about today tell me that you all understand that things aren't moving don't always move as fast as they should in Cyprus. I mean, I, I absolutely agree that things are changing, but, but things have not moved fast and fast. Um, there is a need for real stability. You know, there's a need for anybody who wants to come put the kind of investment that's being talked about into Cyprus. No one will do that unless there's clear political stability. And I think you know, the change in government has made a lot of difference, but still the jury's out. You know, is this a real change? You know, is this going to be another repeat of the last? Yeah. Are we going to see a real change in, in the way that this government is going to operate internationally, or is it going to be more of the same? Thank you. Very, very useful. Thank you. I work for the Rates Register, the oil and gas industry. I share some of the views of the data as to Black Road. But I think we have to be a little bit more optimistic. I would have been optimistic if I'd been given more two minutes. But there is room for great optimism. My only, I'm sorry, just give me 30 seconds. Oh, we need a plan. Right. My biggest concern is no one is making that plan. But but if we don't said, make the plan, if we don't yeah, make the plan, we're going to miss the window of opportunity, which is very, 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 very small. By the way, I, I share, I share the, I share the anxiety. That's my concern. That's my, that's my position too. I'm a little bit more optimistic. And the reserves are not, not good problem yes. yet, but we are very close no, to we are very close to that situation. The, the confirmatory drilling will begin. They say now mid June, it could be July or August. It takes some three months to do the drilling, 70 to 90 days, and another three months after that to process the data. For all the indications are that there is something there. Whether it's viable or not is another uh, another question. But I think we have to be optimistic. Big conglomerates like ENI, Cobas, and Total have invested in other five <coughs> blocks. So this is considerable amount of money, 175 million euros have been spent, and they are prepared to inject another two couple of billion to just go ahead and do the rest of the drilling and so on. Have to be optimistic, but I share your views. We are a bit slow, but we are getting there. And there will be a big opportunity in the future. What we need to do now, if the reserves are there in Block 12 after BD, is to get some um, 
cooperation and agreements with, uh, with, uh, with, with Israel. Um, I know that we had a small discussion before that you are not forget of taking the gas to Turkey through pipelines as probably to be the most I agree with the government there, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, but, uh, it's not the only way. That's why it could be, but I, I mean, that remains to be seen whether there, there will be some agreement on the Cyprus problem. But I think we have to be with them. It can generate a lot of income, direct income from the sales, and there will be, as we said, the other service companies, employment for procedures. And George earlier said that we have to invest in technology. I mean, the profit sharing agreements with these companies uh, entail uh, uh, investment, sorry, <coughs> local content and technology and exchange of uh, knowledge and so on. I think we have to press on these companies now that they should take on board young engineers that George has said earlier to be trained by these companies, by other service companies who will be associated with the development, design companies, construction companies to train these young people now, they are involved now, so it is a condition in the PSA agreement. Uh, we, we have to be optimistic. <coughs> and um, I think this is, this is going to be a major, a major income from Cyprus, but it's not going to save the day. As we said, it is hyped a lot. It's going to have generated an income initially if a product in Block 12 goes ahead, probably half a million, half a billion a year. Over a prolonged period of 25 or more years. There's 20 billion dollars to be invested in the hydrocarbon infrastructure in the next 10 years, believe me. That's the <coughs> Of course it's good. Please don't give me, let me have the idea that I'm negative. I'm not. I'm just saying we don't have a strategic plan. Without it, no one will come to the end. But the, the, the first stage is to get at least confirmation of the reserves first. Which is <coughs> we don't have to wait for that. We don't have to wait. Well, uh, I, I agree that there is, yeah, sorry, it's just kind of running parallel, that's correct. I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's an issue that, that is, that is um, paramount important to the island. And, uh, I mean, I had discussions when I was there with Charles Edwards as well, who was uh, running the, the relatively newly fought in the of Cardinals uh, family up there. And, and he himself expressed you know, frustration at the slowness of the uh, Process. So I think um, you know. I mean, there's no question that there has to be a strategic plan that is implemented uh, with ruthless efficiency. You know, and, um, I'd like to see uh, a minister. I'd like to see under the direction of the president uh, working uh, closely with a uh, critique. You know, to ensure that that plan is formulated and implemented as quickly as possible. Is I mean, Noble themselves very recently have said that they don't see uh, a delay by the Cyprus government. And these were explicitly uh, statements by the recently appointment, appointed president of, 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 uh, of Noble Energy in Cyprus. I do agree that there is a delay, there should be a strategy, and then they go on. But uh, we, we are getting gradually there. They should, this plan should not be in place. I agree. But we have to be optimistic. This is what I'm driving I, I, I think I will conclude with that note that we have to be optimistic. And, uh, yeah, I think that that represents, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, a course for optimism. I mean, there's no question, right, that we could spend another hour, at least another, possibly two hours, you know, debating all of these issues here today. Um, but we haven't uh, solved the uh, time uh, to do that. Um, what I would say is that this is the beginning. This is, this is one of, uh, of many uh, such discussions that uh, I certainly you know, want to work uh, with uh, other organizations in the community. In Cyprus, we have the representatives of the Tra Cyprus Trade Mission here as well. Uh, the, 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 Commercial anti share of Cyprus is here and uh, his deputy as well. And we like that they're here because, because it's, it's important for us to have that connection uh, with the representatives of the Cyprus government, whether they are here in the UK or in Cyprus. And um, when I was in Cyprus, I, I met with Clarice, but I also met with, um, with Charles Edwards, the chairman of the company, which is the gas uh, company. Uh, we met with the chairman and uh, the uh, secretary general of the Czech 
general across the industry there. We met with the uh, CEO of the stock exchange. Um, so we met with the key figures on the island. We had ESG Triangle work in partnership with all of them and with other uh, organizations on the island, with business people on the island, but also with the British government. Uh, we had a meeting with the um, Treasury Minister, uh, Greg Clark, and uh, it was quite clear that the British government uh, wants to engage with us as well. So I think um, this is the beginning, and uh, I'd like to thank you once again for being here with us, for taking part. I know many of you have uh, have a history of contributing to these events, and I'm delighted that many of you are here with us tonight. So I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.